Hello and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. Now you might have heard recently that the University of Minnesota has been banned, yes banned, from contributing to the Linux kernel. That was a very surprising development to say the least. And what's even more surprising are all of the details surrounding what exactly happened and how that came to be. And discussing that actually leads to other topics about open source ethics which is going to be the main talking point of this particular video. I had a chance to sit down with Zhao from TuxCare recently, and he and I had an awesome conversation that was a lot of fun. So, as always, I recorded it, and I'm going to play it back for you guys right now. Enjoy. Hello and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. This is Jay and we're going to have a conversation today about the ethics of open source and I have a special guest with me today. So Joao, introduce yourself. Hi Jay, thanks for having me. So I'm a technical evangelist at Cloud Linux. Um, I'm a next system administrator, a bastard operator from hell as we were called a few <laughs> years ago. Um, yeah, and I work uh, primarily with kernel care and the security stuff at uh, Cloud Linux. So this topic is really relevant to me. And uh, yeah, that's basically me in a nutshell. Yeah, and I, I feel like there's a lot more to that, that there, there's probably all these different directions that you're pulled into and fires that yeah. you put out and things you have to keep an eye of on. Of course. We simplify it in this industry. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I think anyone who works in this industry reads between the lines when someone talks like, yeah, that person does a lot of stuff. So yeah. open source is key to um, both of our backgrounds in different ways. Obviously, yeah. with the YouTube channel, open source is a big element of that. And with your company, you know, you're in the trenches of security and open source. You guys are committing to things like actually putting in pull requests. You guys maintain software, create software. Mm -hmm. So between the two of us, this is a very important topic. Exactly. And we do all that to make sure our customers don't have to worry about it themselves. So yeah, we need to stay on top of uh, kernel vulnerabilities, uh, open SSL vulnerabilities, GLMC, all the important stuff we need to keep an eye out for. And we need to pay special attention to the high profile vulnerabilities, the ones that get the headlines and get the, ha the hackers looking on, into our systems. And that's a gift that keeps on giving. There, there's just no shortage yeah. of security topics to talk about, ranging from a vulnerability that's discovered to they did what? What were they thinking? <laughs> and for some of us, that could be kind of fun. It's like watching a Netflix show, just, just watching the drama unfold as someone makes a very poor decision. And then, um, you know, some people care, some people don't. Obviously, your company helps people not have to care about it if they choose not to want to look into this these kinds of things. But the topic that we're going to talk about today is mainly around a very unfortunate series of events that falls in the category of what were they thinking that yeah. I mentioned earlier with the University of Minnesota and exactly. what happened there. And in order for us to have that conversation, there's a few things we probably should start with. And one of which is, well, why do we like open source? Why is it that we feel so strongly about it. Mm -hmm. so what would you say are your favorite things about open source, the pros? Okay, so the big pros, the big pro, the main one is the community that gathers around the project. When you have more than one person having their say on a specific feature on the direction of the project or something like that, the project gets better than if it's just decided in a closed room by just one or two people pulling the strings. The more eyes you have on the, the code, the more people you have paying attention to it, the better for everybody that is going to use the, the, the result from that project. Either it's a software application or a platform or whatever. Having more people paying attention to it is always better than having less. Of them. I absolutely and, agree. Yeah. And besides that, the for me, the second one, is surely about uh, extensibility. If you need a special feature that is not built into the project that you're using, you're free to 
browse the code, find the place where it should be added, and go right ahead. If you have the know-how on how to do that, well, just go ahead and do it. And if it's really useful, you can submit it. And if other people actually find it useful as well, well, they'll probably accept it into the code for everybody to use. And that's a, that's a very important aspect for me is that you can look at the code. If you want to, mm -hmm. you can. And there's several different abilities that gives you. One of which is if you're a software engineering student, what better way is there to understand how software is actually developed than to look at real code for real mm -hmm. things that people are actually using? And you could also look at the pull request, the dialogue that goes back between the person that put in the pull request that has this exciting idea and is pitching this. And you can see the conversation back and back and forth, which might be that it gets accepted. Or maybe, you know, I like that idea, but I'm a little sketchy about this. Could you work this out a little bit more and get back to me? Um, you could, I mean, that gives us abilities like if we have a music player, for example, it's a great music player, but wouldn't it be nice if it shows the lyrics for the song that you're listening to? And if you know how to code, you could actually develop that. And if the maintainer of that um, you know, likes your idea, then it becomes a part of that project, which is just amazing to me. And, and, and yeah. sorry, uh, going just a bit uh, further down the, the rabbit hole, um, mm -hmm. there is just and something that I read the other day that I found spe especially interesting regarding open source. Let's say that you have, for example, somebody that's colorblind in the community around the project. That person is going to have a real interest when you're designing the interface to support the new themes, new themes or theming support or new skins or something like that that almost all projects want to have today. He's going to have a say and maybe we should have a colorblind mode included with those skins. Maybe we should have a toggle for people that have trouble seeing small fonts, for example, or that we need to have some kind of support for narration features or something like that. So having people with different sensibilities that makes the software better overall. And open source is the real place to do that. I, yeah, you don't have to cool. depend on you don't have to depend on a company thinking about it and oh maybe this has a few more sales and you should do that. You can as an individual participate in the process and steer the help steer the project in that direction. That's a that's a very great point because sometimes you'll have companies that you know, maybe they they want to do the right thing. They want to address an impairment that someone might have, and they'll read about it and study it. But what better situation to talk to someone who actually has that impairment and could give you a firsthand account of what they experience and then help you or help a developer or maybe even write the code themselves and get it in there. And then anyone else who has that in common will then benefit from that as well. Um, and, and you don't really always have to be a developer because um, when I first started, there, I think it was Crunchbang or Crunchbang Plus Plus. So actually, it's not when I first started, but but you know, one of the first pull requests I did, I, I noticed a spelling error in a Bash script. And yeah, I know how to write Bash scripts, but it was so easy. It was just a simple typo. So I submitted a pull request for that, and it was accepted. And mm -hmm. that's a great power to have. So there's all kinds of awesome things that we could talk about with open source. We can make an entire episode about how great it is. But in full transparency, though, we do kind of have to talk about the misconceptions and the things that aren't so great so that we, we have a balance here. Yeah. And one of the misconceptions that I see mentioned over and over is the reliance that people make on open source being more secure just because it's open. You have to understand that not everybody has the deep knowledge of programming. Not everybody knows how to spot the, the vulnerabilities that are in, in the code that will eventually be exploited somehow. There is a very steep barrier to entry to being a security researcher and actually being able to spot those types of problems. Right. Any developer will tell you that uh, reading your own code after a few months is, it might have well been written by somebody else. It's, it's gibberish. Yep let alone the code written by somebody else uh, halfway around the world with their own ways of doing things and initializing variables and calling functions and all that. It's not that easy just because it's open to actually spot the security issues in the, in the code. And I often see people mentioning that open source is more secure because the source is open so everybody can look into it and find those errors. 
case in point, the OpenSSL vulnerabilities that were in the code for over 20 years and were just recently found and actually found to be exploitable. And the code was open during all that time. Nobody actually logged or spotted them. So yeah, that's one of the misconceptions that uh, I see often, well, mentioned everywhere, basically. And, and, and it's not that easy. Point. It's not, and we could be dealing with millions or more lines of code in a single product. And, you know, sometimes people make it sound easy. Yeah, just look at the code and you notice, you'll notice problems if there are any. Maybe not, because maybe the what's required to actually take advantage of a vulnerability is part of a vulnerability chain and a certain order of events have to occur first before it becomes a problem. So you have to kind of be thinking like, almost um, in a, like, I don't want to say backwards, but in a different direction, you want to approach it from different angles. Like, yeah, this authentication system is working and it's got the correct hash and security technologies around it. Um, it's following best practices, but then there could be a loophole that also requires something else to be the case. And those kinds of things aren't very easy to find, you know, yeah. but that's hard. And unfortunately, the teams that are best trained to do that are the hacker teams that are actually doing that on a daily basis and looking for vulnerabilities in code. So when people say, OK, use this software rather than a closed source one just because it's safer, that will sometimes give people a false sense of security that's not really warranted. Open source is great. It's just not so great just specifically because of that. Of course, if you have the source and the vulnerability is found, sure, you can go look at it. You can see how it was fixed. You might even look at other places in the code where something similar happened and actually find other places where it's, where it's actually also vulnerable. But uh, just uh, stating that as one of the, the open source move of open source projects benefits, I see that as a bit abusive. And there, there's so many things that are very hard for, um, especially entry level security people that are just kind of starting out. And, um, you know, if you're in college, for example, you could, you know, maybe security interests you. And then you see on the news that this other individual, your same age, just uh, received a $150,000 payout in one shot because they found this vulnerability. That was a really big one. And OK, let's let's think about this. Um, I'm a student, I could, you know, I got to get my foot in the door in a company. It's going to take a long time for me to build my way up into the company. Or I could just, you know, start looking at code and finding vulnerabilities and just try to get a payout. I mean, is it going to happen? Who knows? But the fact is, you know, there, there's different angles that they go through. But then the uh, that person, um, and I've seen this, where a company tries to take legal action against a person who is just trying to point out that there's a problem. But then there's also the possibility that the person who's finding the vulnerabilities, they don't have the best interest of people in mind. Maybe they're not reporting it in a responsible way, or they're you know being selfish with this, or worse, they've gone to the dark side and they sold, the, uh, sold it to a hacker community. And no one even knows it happens. There's all these different factors with open source that are equally challenging. But what I come down to is though, we can look at it, and that's still an amazing benefit, despite the fact that there's you know other challenges surrounding this as well. Absolutely, and don't get me wrong, I'm not in the slightest advocating for closed source as being better than open source. That's right. not my point at all. It's just that we should mention that it's better for the, the correct reasons. Right. And the accessibility to the code is an important point. It's just not the most important one, in my view. Uh, the sense of community that you get of people gathering around the project, that's absolutely the most important point in any open source endeavor with some years behind it or with some time behind it. That's what drives the, the adoption. That's what drives the improvements. That's what makes it better for everybody who uses the, the project. And that's absolutely true. It, it benefits everyone. And, and yeah, we're bringing up some you know challenges here, but I do feel the pros outweigh the cons by far because mm -hmm. um, it's far worse to not be able to look at it, to not have visibility. And if you're a company that wants to do an audit, and anyone could, you know, um, there's people that'll fund an audit and then pay for someone to do it. And they can do that. They don't have to like ask permission. They can just mm -hmm. look at the code. And as long as they're reporting vulnerabilities responsibly um, and going through the proper channels and things, it, it's an amazing thing to have. But even if you're not doing that, 
and you just want to learn how to write some good C code and you want some good examples of some good code that's written well for your learning so you can actually understand how software is really developed, you have that visibility into how it's done and that would be a horrible thing not to have. Absolutely agree with you there, Jay. And when you mentioned that uh, some people are getting paid to do that, that's very interesting. Basically, when you join a community, an open source community, you self-select to join that community. You, of your own free choosing, you choose to be a part of that community and to somehow contribute to it, either with your time, with your effort, with your translation, with support in the forums, so however you choose. And that is your own choice to do that. But after a while, just your own choice and your own motivation that might not get it. A report recently mentioned that most developers on open source projects, they find the security issues and fixing security issues as a, a drudge. It's not interesting work. They want to write the new feature and then move on to the next one, not go back to old code and fix mistakes. So much so that when the bug bounty program started to crop up everywhere, that's when most bugs were being found and that's when they were getting fixed faster. There was an incentive to do that. So security by itself is not such an appealing topic that gets people interested in spending their own time looking for the bugs and for the problems. The motivation part there is very important. And the bug bounty programs, they have been responsible for finding lots of bugs. Mm -hmm. um, the European Union, the, the Commission has uh, sponsored the bug bounty program last year, I believe, where a select uh, group of uh, open source applications were chosen, Notepad++, Beauty, lots of uh, useful tools that everybody uses daily. And they were paying people to find bugs in them. And guess what? Lots of bugs were actually found and fixed because of that. There was an incentive in getting people to actually go back to the code that has been written some time ago and look for that problem. Absolutely. And I think this kind of just really gets us into the topic, the, the main topic, because uh, you know, if you are interested in security and this is something that you want to do, I encourage you to do it. I encourage you to learn about it, get involved. And, you know, um, yeah, for some people it might be a little boring. Let's be honest. There's probably a ton of caffeine that goes into security, mm -hmm. probably more than some other um, areas of work. But if that's something that you want to make a difference in and uh, take part in, I encourage you to do that, you know, learn the skills and definitely do that. Um, but we kind of have to talk about the University of Minnesota, which is going to be the majority of this, of the remainder of this conversation, because there's so many layers to peel back. There's yeah. so many things done wrong. And this is in an education platform. So you could be some, I mean, I mean imagine being a student and your professor leads you astray. The very person that you trust to develop you right. to be doing things the right way leads you astray. And now your name's attached to something. So. I think what we should do is kind of give a summary of what the heck happened in the University of Minnesota. <laughs> so if you'd like to give us a you know a summary of that, uh, just tell the audience what, what went on here, what happened? It's like a slow motion car crash right there. So <laughs> a few weeks ago, we had these messages crop up in the Linux kernel mailing list, which is a very high volume mailing list. And those ones actually stood out from the, the rest. So in them, uh, Greg Crow Hartman, one of the top level kernel guys, he was uh, berating the, somebody from the University of Minnesota for again submitting patches that were either non-functional or malicious because they created the exploitable code into the, into the Linux kernel. It turns out after looking into this that uh, the, the person responsible for that submission had already made previous submissions with equally not working code or uh, actually exploitable code again previously. And uh, well, they were trying to repeat the, the same feat. And this time they were caught and they were caught red handed with that submission. And uh, it turns out they were trying to do a study on the feasibility of exploiting the goodwill of the kernel maintainers into accepting patches with known vulnerabilities. Um, basically, they were caught. They were told to, OK, now we do not want your code. We're going to remove all the commits that you've made. And in addition, because we cannot trust the, the methods that you guys use at the university, we're going to reverse all the commits 
that we have accepted previously from the University of Minnesota. All in all, it was about 190 reverse that were made after this stand was pulled, and uh, lots of time was wasted dealing with this. It, it's wrong on so many levels. In talking about this, is almost like, well, where do I even start? Uh, you know, um, yeah. one of the one of the things I'll mention is that if the if a if the question is, can a malicious commit either purposely malicious or maybe it's an accidental um, vulnerability? Can something like that make it into the kernel? I think it's to me obvious. Yes. We're dealing with humans here. Um, some people don't have our best interest in mind. Other people, they do have our best interest in mind, but they might not make the best decisions with how they develop the code. So I think in my opinion, and correct me if you feel I'm wrong, I think anyone in the security industry would have, if they knew this study was gonna start, they said, well, yeah, of course it can happen. Um, of course, you, human error happens, but I do also understand that this could have been a legitimate study that would have been of value and would have been interesting to read if it was done using a correct scientific approach with the correct people knowing in a controlled way. It could have been a very exciting study to read nonetheless, but that's not what it is and it's not what it ended up being. This this is a venue of attack. Of course, it's interesting to find out if it's exploitable. Of course, everybody in the security field has an interest in understanding how could this happen and how can we improve the, the process so that it can be prevented. But just going ahead and trying random people, random uh, maintainers of the kernel to see if they are vulnerable themselves, well, that just borders on the unethical side of stuff. This is like right. human human trials for a new drug or something like that without any previous testing, without any warning, without nobody knowing what was happening. And that, from an ethical point of view, that's completely unacceptable. The way it was done, even if the goal was noble, the way it was done, the means don't justify the, the, the end, don't justify the means in any way here. I think this ended up being a um, completely different study, you know, of a, of a completely different thing altogether. And um, I agree. It's just, it's unethical. Um, I think the obvious question here is, okay, well, how could they have um, done this study if people knew that it was going to happen? Now, I was, and, and this is going to sound to the audience like it's completely unrelated, but I promise that there is a point I'm getting to here. I was at the store here in Michigan, doing some grocery shopping or whatever, and a store employee comes up to me and my kids and talks to me. It's like, um, you know, would you like to, to get a $50 gift card? And I'm thinking, oh, this is probably like a sales thing, um, whatever. But I, I listened to what she had to say. And she had said that she is doing a training exercise with her employees that report to her. And she wants to learn how likely they are to catch when someone is trying to steal something. So what she instructed me to do was um, buy something, um, you know, like something went in a box, you'd refund me, whatever it was. I was buying shoes anyway. And she gave me, I'm pretty sure it was a stuffed penguin. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was a stuffed animal. And she said, what I want you to do is sneak this into something that you're buying. Check out in this particular aisle. I'm going to be standing on the other end. I want to see if my employee uh, forgets to check to see if you slip something inside. So I'm like, okay, this is going to be fun. So I bought some shoes. I, I stuffed that right in there and um, we check out. And sure enough, the cashier just scans it, puts it in the bag and um, it's done. And then she walks over and very kindly, nobody got fired. She says, you know, this is, this was a training experiment. Um, and she opened the box, she pulled out the stuffed animal. So, you know, you really do need to check this. This slipped through the cracks and we need to be very careful here. So in that experiment, the proper manager was aware that it was going to happen. And when it comes to this situation, there is a way that you can make the right people aware that you want to do this study, but then maybe someone else isn't aware, but it's controlled. You have a control and you have a variable here. And that's exactly what we were missing. It was almost like you know how some media outlets try to make a sensationalized article where they try to um, do something crazy for clickbait or a YouTube video that um, sets the stage for something outrageous to get views. But this is a study done in a university, not a tabloid or a YouTube channel. This was done at the university level. Wow. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And lots of things had to go wrong for this to happen. First, on the university side, there should be an ethical board that should be aware of the studies. And when yep. these type of studies are conducted, they should have the final say on the methodology that's used. And either they didn't have the final say, so they weren't aware and they should have been, and that's a failure, or they knew and they didn't realize the whole scope of what was being proposed, and they accepted right. it anyway. Then further down the chain, there's the people responsible for the computer science departments that should also be aware of a study and this scope because the Linux kernel is not just like, I don't know, Notepad or something like that. This right. is something that touches lots and lots of devices, lots and lots of people. This is really important stuff. Yeah, and yeah. then on the re the actual researcher side, the, like you said, there was the proper way to do this, or at least some, actually any way was probably better than the way they chose to do right. it. If they had approached the, the top level kernel management, probably they could have arranged for them and presented their case in a way that, okay, we're going to try to improve the, the security process of the patch submission. And we are proposing to do this type of, of uh, scenario to see if we can submit this type of code to, to the kernel. So you guys be prepared, be aware that during these days, at this time, we will be submitting this code and we hope that this maintainer will pick it up or not. And we'll see how it goes. But yep. somebody along the chain had to know about it. In your case, it was yep. the manager of the store. In this case, it would be the, the kernel management that would have to be aware of this. And let's think about how valuable the study could have been in either direction. If something did slip through the cracks in a controlled manner or something didn't, um, if it slipped through, then, okay, this is an opportunity to test the process to understand if it's going to get caught, if they will catch it, to understand how likely that is. If it does get caught, then it makes people feel pretty good. Like, wow, the process works. It's great. Either way, it could have been very valuable. I think it did ultimately prove that the, you know, the process works. Yeah. It was caught. Yeah. Um, so great. But, um, you know, it could have went the other direction too. And then also you have source code that, that someone might have downloaded during the time yeah. it was there. They might have compiled this. They might have put that on a server at the wrong time. That code yeah. could be on a uh, mission critical server somewhere. That code could have been picked up. That's one of the first uh, problems of this study. Um, there is not just Linus tree that has the, the kernel code. All the maintainers have their own trees where they accept the patches when they receive the submissions. And those trees also have lots of traffic. People, not everybody pulls from Linus tree. Lots of people pull from the maintainers of a specific area that they follow or that they do work with or that they want to use on their devices. And this, this brings to light uh, a special case that could have happened and there's no indication either way that it did or did not. But this is a scenario that is not so far-fetched. Imagine one of those low-cost devices that are a dime a dozen on Amazon or eBay or something like that, a media player, a set of box that's five bucks or something like that, where you have a factory that produces, I don't know, one run of the product with 100,000 devices, 10,000 devices, whatever, and they just pick an operating system to use on that device at the time that they are building it and never care about updating it or never look at it again. Who knows, the firm might have just uh, ended production and stopped being in business the week after that. That's so and true. Right now, and right now you have those devices in the wild. They will surface sometime and they will be exploitable because you can be sure that the hackers will now have the code that was submitted and the way to exploit it in the tests that they will be running against servers from now on. Who knows who might have used the code when the, the code was submitted. And remember, it was not just the code that was submitted at that point. There had been previous submissions that were in the code, that were in right. the trees before. So yeah, it might be in the wild. I, I think, honestly, we'll be hearing about this again from a different context. And it could have been even worse than this, because what if, you know, just, just entertaining like an alternate universe here, that it wasn't caught. And let's just say maybe it took them, you know, another couple of weeks or even a couple of months to finalize the report, to grammar check it, to, you know, put it through exactly. its process, to get graded, um, you know, to be, you know, presented. However long that process takes could have been added on to this, that that could have been in the in the stable tree for everyone. And we could even have that in Ubuntu, in, in Red Hat or any distro right now. And then, wow, it's a huge problem, bigger than we ever thought it would be. And it could have been so much worse than this, but it's still pretty bad. I mean, we could be mm -hmm. hearing about it 
um, you know, in the future that maybe there's some kind of bad commit to like an IoT device, like you mentioned, that's being exactly. sold and people's banking information are is being stolen because it's a vulnerable part of a vulnerability chain that exposes that or worse. Maybe a managed service provider goes under their business is over because they just so happen to have that patch and all of the clients that they support are now owned and their data is exfiltrated to the public. There's all kinds of crazy things that can happen as a count of this. And this is not as far-fetched as it seems because the, this snowballs. And not just the vulnerabilities, not just the systems that can be vulnerable with the code. Who knows when it was picked up by somebody doing something. And just imagine that. Even if the people that actually picked up the code that had the vulnerable commits, imagine the number of man hours that are now being used, looking if they have that code in their product and finding the right commits to reverse it and applying the commits and recompiling the kernel and redeploying that to their devices. The amount of work that this study created all over the world, just in dealing with the aftermath from it, it's something appalling. Yeah. And you have to remember, on the open source world, not everybody is getting paid to, to code. Not everybody is getting paid for their work. Lots of people is, are doing this because they love open source. They love writing code. They love working with open source projects. And now they're wasting their time dealing with the cleanup, the cleanup operation for this. And they had no true no fault of their own, other than just use, relying on the Linux kernel at a specific point in time. Right. So, yeah, this undermines a bit the confidence in the in the open source world. Sure, it was picked up, but open source has been building up a, a reputation over the years as a reliable platform, as a, the best way to actually code and to create new stuff and create new applications. And something like this, trying to, to undermine a project like this, it just brings ammunition to the, the closed source side of things. Because on their end, they don't take commits from nobody other than themselves, so they wouldn't be vulnerable to something like this. And this is the wrong type of thing that you want to put out in front of the, the open source movement. That, that, is, that is just so true. I mean, someone could lose their job over this. Their, their boss doesn't understand what this even means. They don't even know what a kernel is, for example. They, they have a, a team of people, and the person there, you know, well, you we you know the hackers got in because it's something you put in the on the server even though there's no way they can go through millions of lines of code unless they have experience with mm -hmm. that and be fired from their job and there's all kinds of um, crazy things that can happen but i think one layer that um is really kind of suspicious to me especially or, or just um egregious is that we're talking about an educational study here and to do an educational study you have to know what you're studying you have to study the, you know, what you're studying, you have to understand what the workflow is in the Linux kernel, what goes in there, where the code ends up, you know, how it spirals out. You have to know that if that patch gets in there, it's going to just go everywhere. It either you, you know, if that person, maybe, maybe they knew that and didn't care. Eh, mm -hmm. it's my study. I wanted to, or maybe they didn't even research it enough to know the ramifications of what they were doing. I don't know the mindset of the individuals that were behind this, but it to me just seems like a, a like just a, a gross misunderstanding of the um, educational process and what research yeah. even means at its core. That was either purposely or not, just not even taken into consideration here. Yeah, I'm, I don't want to attribute this to malice. It's probably just right. an oversight or something like that, but people should have known better. The, the ramifications from this are just too vast to, to grasp, right. but people should have known that the Linux kernel is really very important to try this. That, and they should have done this in a better and more controlled way. They should have followed the scientific method. They should have asked for consent before trying the, the experiment. They should have actually just done everything better, not just this way. It's like they were wearing boxing gloves and trying to type on the, on the keyboard or something like that. They just right. fumbled this as much as they possibly could. It, yeah, it, what I really hope happens out of this is that there are educational studies that are inspired by this, that the professor wants to do it the right way and they do perform the study the right way. And we do benefit from that, everyone benefits from that. And then it encourages people 
to make examples of how to do things like this the right way, how to look at the code and boost the understanding of everything and make a positive impact on everyone. I really hope that this does inspire someone out there, whether they're you know in the education field or not, to get involved and to try, you know, if you have an idea on how you can make this better um, and, and, you th- and you know, you do your research and you do it the right way. I, I would love that so much if, if that's um, what we see in the news um, as time goes on. We don't really know yet how this is going to play out. What's going to happen next? Is there going to be a big explosion because it got into something um, really critical or is it going to inspire someone to do the right thing somewhere? I don't know. But I, I, I think that we're going to hear about this again, and I hope it's in a positive sense. Absolutely agree with you, Jay. So what, you know, here's the thing. This is a lot. And obviously, if, if you're watching this or listening to this, you you care about this stuff. You, this interests you. You like either the open source side of things interest you. Maybe the security side interests you. And that's awesome because it interests me. Otherwise, I wouldn't even be doing this. But some people out there, this is a lot. This is drama. This is like um, the security industry is insane. Like, how do I even keep up with this? This is too much pressure, especially if you're a CTO or a manager where, you know, you're not um, writing code or anything like this. Um, And your company actually gives that, you know, gives people a break from that. It it can give them some peace of mind that they can help sleep at night. So um, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about how your company actually provides peace of mind and takes that liability off of people that don't want to research this. Sure. Um, Like I mentioned at the beginning, I'm an ex-system administrator. I have over 15 years experience. I've been in the trenches dealing with this and applying patches and doing maintenance work and deploying new systems and all that. And keeping up with the growing number of uh, vulnerabilities that are getting reported, keeping up with the patches, making sure you didn't miss something critical that is running on an obscure library somewhere that you're actually using and never thought about it, that can take a lot of work. That can take a toll on your interest, on your enthusiasm for the profession, for the job. And we with, at uh, Cloud Linux with TechScare, we try to, to help the, the IT teams deal with this. With uh, the, the live patching services that we offer, we can make sure that systems are patched as immediately as the patches are released and not just when you have a maintenance window that could be, I don't know, weeks or months ahead if your stakeholders are, are not aware of the actual problems that may arise from leaving the systems unpatched. So we can provide live patching fast. You can rest assured that we test our patches. We deliver high quality patches quickly to every type of enterprise Linux out there. We cover all the major Linux distributions used in the enterprise. We are also now providing under TechScare um, extended lifecycle support for systems that for some reason or another you couldn't or haven't updated yet and you still want to continue to receive security updates, you can do that. Say, for example, you have uh, an old CentOS that's no longer supported by Red Hat that's running on hardware that doesn't have newer drivers for newer versions, or you have a, a tape library that you has all your backups and there is no driver for new for newer versions of Linux. You can continue to use that old version that you have. You, we will provide you with the, the vulnerability fixes. You can rest assured that we, it's going to remain secure. And we are also starting to provide services for current uh, Linux distributions as well. So if you have a a server fleet that's running multiple types, multiple distributions, you don't have to worry about if Canonical has released the patch and Red Hat still hasn't and Oracle is working on the patch, we will deliver the patch for all those distributions at the same time. You install our agent and we deploy the fixes on time with great support from our end. And this just gives you peace of mind and lets you concern yourself with uh, newer technologies and newer stuff. That's the actual interesting part of the system administration work. You don't have to worry about the maintenance and the patching and the maintenance windows and setting all that up. That's just (laughs) a dredge work that you don't have to worry yourself with. That's a a lot. That's a lot. I mean, you're literally helping people sleep better at night. Um, I have to worry so much about some of these things. And... Um, you know, you know, and with all my Linux, uh, obviously, there's, there's, you know, I don't want to get into any of the politics around um, IBM and, and all that, but it, but it did 
create an issue for people and you have a solution for that. You know, it's binary compatible, drop in replacement for CentOS. Exactly. If you decide that that's not something you want to run, you can run Alma Linux. And um, it's a great thing to check out as well. So it's like you guys just do, wow, everything. Um, there's, there's definitely <laughs> a lot there, but there's also the fact that you guys, I mean, the product used to be called Kernel Care, but you branch away from just the kernel and you start yeah, helping exactly. other things, then um, if anyone didn't already know, the name of Kernel Care is now Tux Care because it's not just about the kernel anymore. It's not about the kernel, it's about the common libraries that you use, OpenSSL, glibc, that we also patch so that you don't have to either restart your server or restart your services just to pick up the newer versions that are installed. And we will also be covering databases like MySQL, Postgres, and MariaDB. We will also be doing live updates on that so that you don't have to move your workloads around just to deploy patches on servers. We will be also starting work on on Kimu so that your virtualization stack also gets live patches. I remember that being a hassle when we had to move uh, customer loads around the servers just to be able to patch the hosts with new, with new fixes. And we had to manage the loads on different servers that were not supposed to take so many virtual machines at once while we were deploying patches on one server that we had to restart. And with live patching, we cover all that. You don't have to worry about the orchestration of the services. You don't have to worry about that. We deploy the patches, the patches get picked up as the services are running, and you can carry on knowing that you're secure. And one of the questions I, I have in general about the industry, like, like, why are we still rebooting in 2021? Like, I, I, like 10 or 15 years ago, I would never have thought it ever that we would still have to do that now. It's still perplexing to me that that's even still a thing, but it's just, and it sounds so simple, simply reboot. What's the big deal? That's hard. I've worked with a lot of companies out there that um, they just literally can't do that. And sometimes, you know, it could be the IT person wants to, you know, create this um, highly available system where you could take any server down and the load just shifts to another server, but the budget doesn't account for that. They can't do that, even though it's technically possible. But then there's a service that uh, live patch, you know, it could live patch your kernel, I mean, in your apps. I mean, if you think about that, that's huge because that's, you don't have to reboot. Um, and, and again, why are we still doing that? I can't understand <laughs> that's that. That's a mystery. Yeah. And even on the high availability scenarios, remember that when you're taking down nodes on a high availability scenario, you're mm -hmm. increasing the risk that if a failure happens on one of the nodes that is still up, it's going to be critical faster than when you had more nodes available. Right. So even in high availability scenarios, not rebooting, that's a benefit as well. You it don't is. have to use high availability just to cover your maintenance windows. I've seen entire highly available systems fall over because the um, you know there's like a timeout where a server is expected when it comes online, it's usually ready within five minutes or something. So we're going to just skip the status track for <laughs> five minutes. And it's just long enough to where it's not available quick enough and the other servers are getting overloaded faster than new servers become available. And the whole thing just okay. falls over. It's very complicated. So it's very great to have a, a company that's looking into these things and trying to, to, again, help us sleep better at night. And as you said, servers timing out, well, that happens regularly on huge databases when they're trying to replicate the changes that happened when one of the nodes was down. The process just sticks there for time and time. And, and sometimes it times out and you have a problem now. You have your nodes up, you don't know which ones have the most recent versions of the data. You have to find a way to manually replicate that and you're in trouble again. I've been into, the, I, I, yeah, I worked at a company early in my career. We ran into that literally every month, every yeah. Single month. I got to the point where someone even mentioned MySQL. I got anxious before they even <laughs> were able to tell me what it was they wanted to talk about. Yeah. Um, we had to manually rsync things just to kind of catch a database server up. And one point, just delete the server, create a new one. And I'm thinking, with all the work that you're constantly doing to keep things in sync and sometimes recreate servers, like there has to be a quicker way. Um, definitely a problem that we really experience. And um, yeah. it, it, you're a company out there, and you say, "Well, we got that all figured out. We never had that problem." You are one in like a million at this point, because it is technically, there's always something that can go wrong. Um, you're never gonna think yeah. of everything. That's the important thing. This is just about reducing the risk and the ways that yeah. things can go wrong, as you say. The less things that can go wrong, the less troubles you're going to get if something actually does. And even if something goes wrong, we are also providing support in that case. So we got you covered anyway. 
And I have to say for personal experience, when your boss talks to you and says, you know, I heard this on the news, there's a big vulnerability um, and it requires all this work to do. Have you already done that? And you're able to say, yeah, I fixed that last Tuesday. It's fine. Um, you know, or, or it was on, whether it was automatically fixed or you're taking credit for it, whatever. Um, it, it, it's, it's a darn good feeling. It's like, yep, yeah, we're good. Yeah, we don't worry about that. Like let everyone else yeah. that, uh, you know, doesn't have my skills, obviously, <laughs> or my choices and in, in services we use uh, deal with that. But we were covered. And, and, you know, people like that. It's a great feeling. And uh, again, helps you sleep better at night. And security is just one of those things that it's never going to end. There's going to be no shortage of things that people find clever ways to bypass this, bypass that. And have you, you got to have someone looking at that for you. So um, I really appreciate the time that you've uh, spent with me today. This has been a very fun conversation. Well, likewise. This was my pleasure, Jay. Awesome. So I'll include some links in the in the description down below where you can um, you know check out some of these things that we talked about today and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Click that like button if you want to encourage YouTube to push conversations like this higher in the metric. I always appreciate that. And again, thanks for watching.